On the Gary Bisbee Show, hear practical lessons from today's healthcare insiders. We'll uncover stories about their challenges, paths to success, and the skills that they've developed. As together, we'll explore how the healthcare economy is transforming. Several months ago, Dr. Marty Macri wrote op-ed pieces in the Wall Street Journal that predicted that the U.S. would reach herd immunity in April or May of this year. Curiously, many governmental and establishment figures did not pick up on Marty's findings. In this conversation, we explored the reasons for Marty's successful prediction and why many experts were silent on it. Dr. Marty Macri is a surgeon and professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Marty is an accomplished author, and his most recent book, The Price We Pay, being introduced in soft cover early in June, is a collection of fascinating stories that emphasize the importance of solving the affordability gaps in U.S. healthcare. We dug into the affordability crisis with Marty, and we engaged with him about how healthcare in the U.S. can become more equitable and affordable. Good morning, Marty, and, and welcome. Good morning, Gary. Good to see you again. Great to have you at the microphone. I'd like to kick right off with two congratulations. One, of course, is the soft cover of The Price We Pay is basically now available and uh, been included a look back to COVID. It was originally published right before COVID, I think, in 2019. And secondly, tell us about uh, the Business Book of the Year Award. That's awesome. Oh, thanks, Gary. I was really excited about that. The uh, Journalism Association awarded the book, the Business Book of the Year Award. So I'm excited about this second edition. It's updated for COVID and it's in paperback, so it's also cheaper. Well, for those of us that have the hard copy, we might want to buy the soft copy just for the COVID update. I'm sure your publisher views it that way. <laughs> They'll be excited about that, yeah. <laughs> the second congratulations is uh, referencing your point about herd immunity. And you wrote an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal in February, followed up by one in March, making a point that if you add those with vac vaccinations and natural immunity, you were approaching herd immunity, or would at least in the, in the April-May timeframe. And uh, today, the CDC, of course, issued the guidelines that said those of us that are vaccinated don't need masks inside or outside, and don't worry about social distancing. So you called that. Uh, the question there is, how do you think about this idea of herd immunity? What is it, and why is it important, Marty? Well, Gary, I think the um, big deal is that natural immunity is real, it works, and it's been blown off by our public health official officials. And when you talk about calculations to high herd immunity levels, and you ignore the fact that half of unvaccinated people have natural immunity, that's a big omission. And it changes the path to herd immunity a lot. And it changes the time frame. So what we saw with the CDC guidance saying, hey, all of a sudden vaccinated people can take off their masks indoors or anywhere, it came out of nowhere. It came out of the blue because they were responding to public perception that, hey, the community risk is extremely low, infinitesimally low among vaccinated people. And there's not a lot of um, infection out there. Cases have plummeted faster than the CDC anticipated. So they responded to public perception, issuing that guidance that really was based on data three months ago. So um, many of us now, by the way, I wasn't the only one saying that we're going to see herd immunity late spring. There were a couple of us, all of whom had some public platform, but really just felt like the message being uh, broadcast from on high was missing natural immunity and that it was roughly half of the population. And so all of us after that article came out where I, where I suggested we'll hit herd immunity in late spring in time for a normal summer. Remember, that was a time when people were cooped up and depressed. And so there was a lot of pent up giddy and that excitement translated into a misinterpretation that herd immunity means eradication. And of course, I said in the article, that it absolutely does not mean that. And that I said uh, the infection will be around for you know many, many decades. So we quickly switched to the term population immunity to avoid the stigma of the word herd. And we've seen population immunity really kick in since then. Good term, population immunity. We'll start using that. But what about the natural immunity from the standpoint that 
the powers that be really haven't addressed that. You don't hear that um, as a causal, fa you know, causal condition to get us to population immunity. Why do you think that is? Well, I've actually had personal conversations with Dr. Fauci about this and have been, you know, poking a lot of the national figures saying, hey, talk about natural immunity. The seroprevalence study from California confirmed that it's about half the population, 45% of LA residents back in February. I mean, since then, there's been a lot of, a lot more natural immunity. And so, um, I don't know. I think to, you know, what they will, te what they will say, what they've told me is, we don't have good data, right? And of course, it doesn't fit the beautiful randomized controlled trial model because you can't randomize a population to natural immunity. And there's this sort of far-reaching hypothesis that natural immunity could drop off like it's dropping off a cliff. But my response has been, open your eyes. We are not seeing reinfections after 15 months of this coronavirus being around. That tells you that natural immunity is working. If there were reinfections, we'd be talking about them. And by the way, the few rare times we see them, it's, they're very mild cases. Even in the Danish study, um, it was six tenths of 1% at a time when there was a lot of infection. Now there's a lot less infection. We're at the point where we've got at least 50% now, maybe 55% of the adult population has been vaccinated. I think we're at 85 or 90% of the 65 and older being vaccinated. So if you add in natural immunity, the population immunity is starting to approach uh, 80 or 90 percent. Is that the way you look at that? Yeah, it changes everything. If you recognize the power of natural immunity, then all of a sudden the path to high population immunity is a lot different. It no longer requires vaccinating every kid, vaccine mandates, and coaxing and demonizing uh, those who are hesitant. Some Americans have been hesitant for good reason. They've got natural immunity from prior infection. Let's respect their decision and stop ostracizing them. If we wanna help the hesitancy problem, I can tell you as a doctor, you win more bees with honey than fire. And if we could just make vaccines more available on a walk-up basis where it's convenient and easy. We saw a very slow pivot to walk-up as soon as we had a surplus. That's how you really help address the hesitancy issue. Yeah, I agree. I think this whole idea of retail vaccinations is the key. It just go door to door if you need to. Yeah. Why don't we turn to the price we pay? And you started, of course, with unaccountable. So what was the thinking behind you starting with unaccountable and then moving to the price we pay? We pay? Why did you embark upon writing the price we pay, Marty? Well, I think the, the reason to write a book is if you feel that there is a message out there that really needs to be told that is not currently being told. And as a resident, I saw wide variations in quality of care at the best institutions in the, at the, in the country. I had the privilege of um, going to school at Harvard and I'm at Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, a lot of these great institutions and even in rotations at other universities you see common themes, and that is that um, st the standardization of care is vastly underappreciated, underrecognized, and underadhered to. And so that was this, um, really unaccountable. It was really just a bunch of stories from residency. And then um, after I felt like I had shared my perspective on variations in quality, the problem of variation in price was getting to be a big issue and more and more you know businesses were getting crushed with healthcare costs and i wanted to sort of do what the big short did and that uh, book and movie did something amazing and in the world of storytelling and writing it's really an art form and that is how do you take a very complex wonky and even boring subject and make it exciting make it a story a storybook and simplify the topic so anybody can understand it so you can democratize health policy and I basically tried to explain that the reason the healthcare costs are so high is number one, the price of care. You know, we talk about the price of services rather than the healthcare costs, it's more relatable. Um, var uh, variations in the appropriateness of care, over treatment, over medicating, over operating, um, and then finally care coordination. So 
I was privileged to be able to tell the story of a lot of disruptors in each of those spaces in the book, The Price We Pay. Well, The Big Short became a movie. Are we looking at potential movie here for The Price We Pay, Marty? <laughs> no, I, I, no, I, you know, I, um, I don't know if you know, but I sold the book on accountable rights to the TV series, The Resident. And when I watch it, I cringe because some of the stuff is, I'm thinking, that's not how we actually do it in the hospital. But um, Amy Holmes has done a great job trying to tell uh, the public about some of these issues of uh, quality and pricing failures in healthcare to the publics to empower people. And she's done a great job with that show. Well, the price we pay included a listening tour. You just have story after story in the book. It's fascinating to work through them. Uh, you didn't really use the term affordability, but let me put that term on the table. It's certainly suggested by the title and many of these stories. How do you look at affordability these days, Marty? Well, first of all, the public has a right to be angry right now. That's one thing that I learned. That was my number one take home message from this two year listening tour. When 48% of all federal spending is going to healthcare in its many hidden forms, and I, I mean that, that's not, I'm not misspeaking. We have a paper out on our restoringmedicine.org website under reports. We've got, I've got a piece in USA Today that explains it's not just Medicare and Medicaid. It's half of social security checks now are going to healthcare, co-pays, deductibles, non-covered services. It's 15% of the Defense Department's budget goes to healthcare for their own system. And that's separate from the VA, which is almost 5%. And interest on the debt is interest on healthcare spending. So almost half of federal spending is going to healthcare. People, American families are paying $20,000 a year on private health insurance on top of that. They say, oh, my employer's paying part, I'm paying, but no, they're paying all of it. It's coming from the same pool of money of wages and benefits. And then they get a bill for $4,000 and told this is not covered. People have a right to be angry right now. I, what I learned is uh, we've got good people in healthcare at every level. This is not a system we designed. This is a system our generation inherited and it's an entirely broken system. We've got good people working in a bad system. And so I've seen the disruptors on the price transparency front, on the direct contracting front, hospitals innovating, insurance companies using new models, and doctors saying, hey, look, our current system of practicing healthcare is broken. We don't like it. The patients don't like it. Why are we doing it? And as Rashika Fernandopol told me, this old model of you come in to see us as doctors, and we tell you exercise more, eat better and then come back in a year and we tell you, you bad, you know, bad non-compliant patient in 10 right. minutes and throw meds at you. Right. Look at the clinics that are now treating diabetes with cooking classes instead of just throwing insulin at people and treating back pain with ice and physical therapy more than surgery and opioids and treating loneliness with communities like Chen Med and treating, um, cancer by talking about environmental exposures and health and food as medicine in treating chronic disease instead of just throwing pills at people. That's the exciting revolution in healthcare that I, I really um, loved learning about and sharing in, in that book. Well, those are private sector initiatives that probably fall in a social determinants of health category. With all of the spending on the part of the government, half of the, half the government spending being healthcare related, or directly healthcare, what role is the government ought to be playing in changing the incentive structure and moving toward uh, both more social determinants and perhaps even more of a managed care model? What, what do you think the solution is here, Marty? Gosh, you I'm sure have more insights on this than I do know, knowing all the wisdom that you have from healthcare, but I'll share with you my observation is that affordability is an access Path. And as a matter of fact, it's the number one way to increase access and tear down barriers that we see with so, the social determinants of health. And so um, we can keep throwing good money after bad into this system. And, you know, I open the book by showing how doctors just around the U.S. Capitol building within miles are putting unnecessary stents in leg plaques that don't meet criteria but they know how to game the system and Medicare is paying for all of it to show that we can keep throwing money into the system or we can start to get wise about using what I call appropriateness measures. That's a big project now that my team and I are doing. How do we identify pat practice patterns of appropriateness 
and maybe replace pre-authorization with gold carding providers that fall within that, those boundaries of normal variation. Practice variation is good and healthy within boundaries. And it turns out that when you talk to experts, they will tell you, the docs will tell you in that narrow specialty, this is a pattern that's outside of the boundaries of reasonable. It's a pattern that's indefensible. It's a pattern that's a byproduct of our fee-for-service system. Relating standards to appropriateness is the right way to do it. Uh, I can remember 10 or 15 years ago, there was a lot of discussion about appropriateness, but it was without standards. And so then it was interpreted as uh, not really best practices. So I love what you're doing, love that project, like to stay in touch with it. What do you think about managed care uh, as a model? Is that something that we could uh, put our arms around and think that that's gonna help? You know, I think um, managed care came with the promise that if we kind of police care, it'll save money and that savings will be greater than the cost of policing. I think the real world laboratory conclusion of that experiment is that it didn't deliver the savings that it promised to deliver, deliver because it's hard to know what the unregulated practice variation would be. But an entire infrastructure got set up and it burdens us as doctors. As a matter of fact, it drives us crazy sometimes. <laughs> and especially those of us who are subspecialists at tertiary medical centers. Um, so I, I think there's a role for it, but I think it's gotta be done better. And so what we're doing with a new project called Global Appropriateness Measures is developing practice patterns of appropriateness and uh, making those algorithms available. And so what we're seeing is that organizations are saying, hey, we wanna know which physicians are way overboard in terms of their C-section rate or rates of doing spine surgery without prior physical therapy or conservative therapy. And so those, are, those appropriateness measures are, are things that I wrote about in the book, The Price We Pay. And I think an exciting fear, there's a lot of frustration with quality measurement, right? And that's the other half of the value equation. It's, the field is stagnant. We spend $16 billion just collecting these measures each year. People are frustrated. I'm frustrated because my surgical infection rate and readmission rate does not capture the quality of my surgical skill or clinical judgment. And so people are looking for quality that is going to move into a new area called appropriateness of care. That's the crisis we're in. We have a crisis of appropriateness. And it's not gonna be evidence-based like we've painted ourselves in a corner to define because a lot of good practice lacks a randomized controlled trial. That's the reality. You're never gonna do a study of a doc with a C-section rate of 62% and compare them to doctors with a C-section rate of 20%. That study would be unethical. So we have to sometimes say, hey, evidence, it can be defined differently and it can use clinical wisdom when there's a consensus among specialists. Let's go back to appropriateness. So what kind of support do you have in the field among your physician colleagues or uh, leaders of the health systems for appropriateness measures? I would say the, uh, there's been a lot of enthusiasm across the board, but on, I would say one of the sad stories is that the hospital systems that are using the appropriateness measures are the ones that share risk financially. Now that's great and I love it, but that's where we're seeing the appropriateness measurement um, measures get adopted broadly into practice. And I wish it were those on the fee-for-service side as well. I wish it didn't rely on the financial motive of sharing risk to say, hey, we wanna look under the hood and understand which pediatric surgeon is doing too many umbilical hernia repairs in young kids when they sh the kids should be waiting till age five. Again, the idea of appropriateness measurement is that we have to get off of the all or nothing clinical pathway and look at patterns in big data. Well, we're gonna be looking for progress in your appropriateness study, Marty, so good job and uh, keep up that good work. Why don't we turn to you personally? What point did you decide medicine was going to be your future? My dad uh, is a hematologist and I would say growing up in, I grew up in Danville where Geisinger is. Um, amazing how <laughs> Geisinger has been a force nationally 
And I'm proud to be a part of that little tiny town in central Pennsylvania that's like three hours from any international airport. So, <laughs> and had no movie theater going, growing up. But when you go to the grocery store and you see somebody at random um, give your dad a hug and start breaking down in tears saying, thank you for caring for my dad when he passed away, or <clears throat> thank you for giving me my life back. How can you not be attracted to that? And I became really proud of my dad and the community. He was respected. He's retired now. But that's something that I just felt this intrinsic desire to be a part of because I saw it up front and, and personal. You're also interested, I think, in politics. You certainly are playing in that space. When did that interest develop, Marty? Well, I try to pride myself in, in being independent. But yeah, I, look, I go on cable news a fair bit. I go on Fox News a fair bit, which sometimes you know, those who know I go on Fox News to do medical commentaries don't like me because it's Fox. And then those who watch Fox hear my independent, you know, um, sort of non-loyalty. Non -loyalty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> non-loyalty to a specific narrative. Right. And they don't like me. So it's right. a very lonely place sometimes. <laughs> I've, look, I've enjoyed um, advising political leaders at the highest level. And I think the cool thing is that they value an academic's independent perspective because stakeholders are all pushing an agenda, as they should, you know, they should be vo voicing their concerns. And they see an academic sometimes as, tell us the way it really should be. So I think staying politically independent has really helped my credibility and also opened a lot of doors in DC where both people, people from both sides of the aisle will say, you know, give us a big idea. We want to champion some big idea. And it's been really cool. When do you write? I mean, you're so busy, so much going on. When do you actually have time to write? <laughs> well, actually, I'm in a hotel room right now um, traveling, and I'm, uh, I try to write on planes, uh, write nights and weekends. Like I, the medical school asked me to give a, a lecture to the medical students at Hopkins on work-life balance because the students... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was my response. I was right. like... You got the wrong dude, you know, you gotta, I'm sorry, find somebody else, you know. Do you enjoy writing, Marty? I do. Um, I, I enjoy sort of the art of taking a complex subject and making, making it consumable and digestible to both healthcare professionals and experts and the lay public alike. It's an art form that many of my friends have, have mastered, uh, Tul Gawande and others, and I, I've always admired that. And so um, it, it's, I, I look, I, I, again, the reason to write is to feel, if, is, is to um, say something that you feel is, needs to be said that's not being said. And with natural immunity, that was one of those things where I felt like I can't believe we're ignoring this, the fact that half the population is immune on top of those getting vaccinated. And it does, they're not mutually exclusive. We can still encourage everyone to get vaccinated. I do enjoy writing. Of course, 45% um, of the population is going to hate your guts the second something comes to print. <laughs> well, it is an art form to be able to write about these complex topics and make it understandable for, uh, for everybody, which you're, you're terrifically good at. So keep writing. And speaking of that, what's the next book, Marty? I'm really interested in um, the microbiome and, and how it uh, relates to health. You know, so much of health is really... Uh, inflammation comes down to inflammation and when we talk about health in a hundred years Gary I think we're going to be talking about uh, what's your level of inflammation and it's it's measurable to some degree we've got some crude tests now like high, highly selective c-reactive protein but inflammation is why people die of heart attacks the blood vessel wall gets inflamed and that's when the cholesterol moves in um, and the lipids move in um, it's implicated in cancer it's why we have a whole host of diseases we never had before, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, irritable bowel. These are common. They didn't exist before 1920. Why is that? Maybe the advent of antibiotics, which screws up your microbiome. Now, antibiotics save lives. I've seen that, but when not indicated, and studies show from the, even from the CDC that up to 70% are not indicated, it screws up your microbiome, processed food, added sugar, bottle feeding instead of breastfeeding when somebody can breastfeed, even C-section versus vaginal delivery and not washing a baby immediately upon delivery. All these things influence the microbiome. We don't talk about it. The science just hasn't caught up. I think it's the big frontier in healthcare. 
And as somebody who has a background in gastrointestinal uh, medicine uh, and GI surgery, it's been something that's always fascinated me. So I think it's the future, and, and, I, and it relates to food as medicine, which is also something I'm passionate about. Well, we'll be looking for that one, Marty. Thank you so much. This has just been a terrific interview. Sorry you had to do it in a hotel room, but you do, do a lot of traveling. So thanks again, Marty. Great to see you, Gary.